Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. My name is Matt Cannon, and I'm uh, pleased to welcome you to the uh, Tomcat Center Winter Innovation Showcase. Uh, if you uh, haven't attended one of these events before, uh, we feature startup companies that have uh, originated at Stanford and that we have supported uh, at the Tomcat Center through our uh, innovation transfer program. Uh, we'll hear from the the CEOs of three companies today, and uh, as you can uh, you can tell from the uh, announcement of the event, they're they're working in very different industries, um, but they share a common thread in that they are all uh, building businesses that have the potential to have a significant impact on energy and sustainability. Um, that's a common thread for for all of the teams that we have supported at the at the Tomcat Center over the years, and and I should take this uh, opportunity to say that the Innovation Transfer Program is just about ten years old. Uh, we were just talking beforehand about uh, having a birthday celebration, uh, perhaps sometime this year. Um, and in that period, uh, we've supported just about a hundred teams. Uh, there are about seventy five active companies um, that have come out of, of the work of those teams, um, in addition to uh, six acquisitions and, and a few mergers. Um, so today, uh, we're going to hear from uh, the CEOs of, uh, oh yes, and, and Donica um, has a link to our website where you can learn about uh, any of the other ventures uh, that have come through our program. Um, so today we're going to hear from uh, the CEOs of, of companies working in transportation, in heating and cooling, and in uh, electronic repairs. Um, our, our goal is, is pretty simple. Uh, we're, we're just here to, to hear their story, to learn more about the companies and be inspired, um, and to allow you uh, an opportunity to connect with them if you see any opportunities uh, to work together or to invest. Um, so what we'll do is um, we'll hear from uh, from each person about 10 minute presentation, uh, and then there will be uh, about five minutes for Q&A after that. Um, if you have a, a question you would like asked um, that, that comes to mind during the presentation, um, please submit that through the, the Q&A feature. Um, I will I will do my best to accommodate questions, um, but usually there are questions that we we don't get a chance to get to. Um, however, the um, the speaker can follow up with you uh, individually afterwards, um, and uh, we encourage you to uh, to reach out to us at the Tomcat um, uh, if you would like uh, like help in connecting with any of the speakers today. Also want to encourage you to uh, join the uh, LinkedIn Tomcat networking group um, where uh, many of the uh, of the ventures that we've supported over the years um, uh, can be uh, can be linked to. So okay, so uh, we'll start today um, with uh, David Manasabas Jono, uh, who is the CEO of Aeromutable. Um, Aeromutable is developing uh, flow control technology to uh, dynamically modify the aerodynamic behavior of heavy trucks to improve their efficiency. Um, just one fun fact uh, to sort of uh, kick off the presentation by David, um, heavy trucks in the U.S. Uh, annually uh, log about 300 billion uh, vehicle miles driven. So uh, with that, David, I will uh, turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is David Manosalvas Jono, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Aramidable. At Aramidable, we're bringing aerospace technology into the trucking industry, and our initial product is a device that attaches to the back of a semi, and it's able to provide three times uh, the fuel savings than any of our competitors because we have an active system. The key to our technology is that we dynamically optimize the vehicle performance um, based on real world conditions. Um, in the US, the trucking industry moves around 80% of the commercial and consumer goods. And to do this, it actually goes um, over the road for over 448 billion miles per year. Through this process, the trucking industry is responsible for using uh, around 30% of the total US fuel, which translates to emitting 654 million tons of CO2. 
When the modern semi-truck was introduced, particular emphasis was placed on having a big engine to make sure that it can carry really heavy loads. A significantly spacious cabin to make sure the drivers can sit there for 10, 11 hours every day. Uh, a big trailer to make sure that many goods can fit in there and that they can be carried from point A and from point B. And a flatback to make it easy and efficient to load and unload. But nobody really thought about aerodynamic efficiency at the time. And over 65% of the total energy used by these vehicles on highway speeds goes towards aerodynamic drag. And that flat back that was so useful for loading and unloading, well, unfortunately, it actually creates an aerodynamic nightmare. It has uh, the propensity to create a turbulent wake, which causes a low pressure, and it takes a lot of energy out of the system through drag, making it one of the lead contributors to drag for those vehicles. At Aeromutable, we are developing a device that attaches to that very back of the semi and in a real trucking road is able to provide up to 16% of fuel savings. Our patent vending technology leverages our deep understanding of ground vehicle aerodynamics with our system's ability to measure its surroundings such that we can modify the aerodynamic profile of the vehicle and improve its performance. The way how we do it is by creating virtual surfaces made of air that are able to actually streamline the vehicle. And through this vehicle streamlining, we're able to improve the fuel efficiency by containing the wake, stabilizing it, and increasing the pressure on the inside of this wake. In that way, being able to decrease the amount of drag that's being generated and decrease the amount of energy needing to move this vehicle from point A to point B with all the goods that we want. In the US, there's around 2.8 million long haul tractor trailers in operation. And from those 2.2 million of those are the ones that have a square flat back, which is the platform for which we've been developing our device. And this gives us a $15 billion market in direct sales for this product alone. After spending a lot of time and continually doing customer discovery, we've talked to hundreds of people in the trucking industry, uh, everywhere from trucking companies, uh, trucking associations, trucking tech companies, uh, suppliers, OEMs, drivers, operation managers, maintenance managers, company owners, really you name it. And we've talked to somebody with that title within the trucking industry. And after really looking at all this data, the conversations that we've had, the questions, the pain points, uh, we've realized that our beachhead market is a $5 billion life composed uh, of the refrigerated tractor trailers. And one of the reasons is because they have a ratio closer to one to one between tractor and trailers, which make them especially um, interesting for us since we will be able to give our customer the value that's being created for every mile that their vehicles are driving. In this space, um, there's a few other products that are competing for um, becoming the industry standards, starting with the trailer tail, uh, the top kit, and the rocket tail. But looking at them side by side with our device, you can see that we can provide three times more fuel efficiency than our nearest competitor. In addition to that, our system has a low operational impact since it does not force the driver to do anything outside of what they ordinarily do by opening and closing doors. In addition to that, our system is able to provide true stability improvement because we are a dynamic system that actively senses what's happening around the vehicle it uses air injection to control what's going on. And in addition to improving fuel efficiency, it also increases its stability and safety. Um, by decreasing fuel efficiency, our technology focuses in decreasing carbon emissions in addition to improving profitability. And by looking at what will be the impact of this on the environment, looking worldwide on full adoption uh, today, we would be able to save 400 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. But, taking a closer look to something closer to home, if you may. Um, in one year in California, just looking at a 10% market adoption, our technology is able to reduce the carbon emissions compared to the equivalent of removing 66,000 gasoline power vehicles. Um, from the energy perspective, our technology is saving enough energy to power almost 39,000 American homes every year. And with this 10% adoption in California, once we reach that milestone, um, our technology will decrease the amount of carbon emissions that are equivalent with carbon sequestration 
by 364,000 acres of US forestry. To bring this technology and this product to market, we put together a great team, um, starting with my co-founder and myself. We both hold PhDs in engineering from Stanford University, as well as certificates in innovation and entrepreneurship from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, in addition, we put together a technical advisory board with experience in trucking, uh, business, entrepreneurship, as well as engineering that are helping us bring this product to market. To date, we've raised over $800,000 in non-diluted funding, as well as a 2.4 million uh, venture capital round. We've been supported by both private as well as public institutions. Um, and we are really working with the trucking industry to help them decrease their carbon footprint while increasing their profitability. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, I'll, I'll start actually with a, just a question about um, how, how you got into this uh, into this space in the in the first place. So, so how, how did you become aware of this technical challenge and 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 then the the business opportunity? Yeah, you know, um, it was a combination of, of events. Um, the way how I got involved into trucking and trucking aerodynamics was through my PhD. When I started looking at different topics that I could study in depth in order to um, work towards my doctoral degree, um, I realized that I wanted to work on something that had impact and that was technically challenging. Um, and aerodynamics of semi-trucks and of heavy vehicles uh, really met both of those standards. Um, first off, because on the impact side, um, a lot of these vehicles, particularly the trailer is almost commoditized. So it always has the same shape. It always has the same length um, with small variations, of course. And this allowed me to be able to focus on improving its effectiveness and be able to create an impact that will continue to go through the entire industry rather than just focus on one particular model or one particular car. And then from the technical side, uh, with a background in mechanical engineering and aerospace um, and with a love for fluid dynamics, the idea of studying the fluid dynamics of heavy vehicles through the use of computational fluid dynamics was highly appealing since it's a very challenging type of flow where it has a high Reynolds number, but a low Mach number. Um, and in addition to that, having separation and having uh, wake structures that are not easy to simulate um, really made it for a fun and challenging problem. And when I got to start working on that, that was really what I was looking for, a nice challenge that had some impact and that will allow me to continue um, really challenging myself both academically as well as uh, from the climate impact point of view. Right. Um, on, on the other side of your question, that was the business, um, the business side. Um, I started to get involved on the business side towards the end of my PhD when I realized what was the impact that modifying the aerodynamic behavior of uh, semi-trucks could have. And really conversations with members of the Tomcat Center with Brian, as well as uh, being a part of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, um, Excel Fellows at the time, and doing Ignite in the graduate school business, they all contributed towards helping me realize how to find that value proposition and select the, the potential customer segments to go after. Thank you. That's a great uh, soundbite. You're sort of a poster <laughs> child for the entrepreneurial community in, in the hard tech space here at, at Stanford. Uh, so thanks for, for sharing that. Uh, there's a few questions on the, on the business side from, from the audience. I'll get to those in, in just a minute. Um, but I, I wonder if you, if you could tell us a, a little bit more about the the device or the the actual technology. What's sort of the footprint of it, of it on the on the vehicle? Um, and you mentioned that you know there's very little operational burden on the on the driver. But if you maybe just tell us a little bit more how it works, so we can sort of understand um, you know when it's operating, what what what's happening. Yeah. So um, we use um, something quite unique when it comes to the back of semi trucks, and it is an add-on to the back of it. Effectively, our product replaces the back doors of the vehicle. And within that back door packaging, um, it has all the brains and all the mechanics that it needs in order to be able to inject air in the four corners of the vehicle, top, bottom, and the two sides. Um, our system is able to select where does it need to introduce the air in order to better modify the aerodynamic behavior of the truck by measuring its environment. 
in that way being able to not just modify the aerodynamics, but modify them specifically for that particular condition uh, where that vehicle finds itself in order to improve the fuel efficiency, not just at a particular cruise condition, like it's traditionally done when it comes to passive systems that just deploy, but it's able to continue to optimize its behavior through the entire operation. So if there's wind, it's able to compensate for that. If there's other cars passing, it's able to stabilize the back. And if it finds itself in a position where it's just cruising down the road with very little interference, it will maintain a condition that will improve fuel efficiency through the entire drive. Great. Okay. So yeah, this is a good segue, I think, to, to some of the, the business questions. So um, so what do you see as the the major barriers to to market entry um, and, and sort of what's your strategy for, for overcoming those? Yeah, one, one of the big barriers in trucking as a whole is the fact that this industry has been plagued with um, half-baked solutions to help them improve their bottom line. Anywhere from magnets on, on your fuel line to different kind of magical oils to make your truck go faster. Um, so there is a certain level of skepticism from the trucking industry to adopting new technologies, particularly um, technologies that use ideas that have not been working that industry before. Um, and one of the ways how we've been working towards overcoming those barriers is really working with the trucking industry. Uh, we're members of the California Trucking Association. Uh, we work with multiple fleets around California to really build that trust, um, be able to work with them during our development such that they can see what we're doing, how we are making progress, what are we focusing our efforts on, and really taking their input when it comes to um, user friendliness, when it comes to features on the product, as well as when it comes to looking at what is important for them. Um, and one of the ways how we plan to enter the market, um, as we don't have a product out there yet, is through pilots. So working directly with trucking fleet so they can try it, they can see what it does for their operation. And then after they've tried it, they can start to purchase it. And that way is almost a risk-free um, approach for them to be able to take a look um, and then be able to see what it actually means for their operation. Because for many of these trucking companies, the values that you get from wind tunnel tests or from track tests, they're appealing, but they don't really tell them what's gonna happen to their own operation. So we wanna really cross that, that chasm and be able to show them what it means for their operation so they can really extract all the values that our technology is bringing. And, and you envision, so it primarily will be sort of retrofits to existing trucks, or this will be incorporated into new vehicles that a, that a company is, is buying? So at the very first stage of, of our rollout to market, we expect it to be an add-on system that will retrofit into existing trailers. Um, we, we plan to follow a similar path to what skirts have done. Um, and just to make it short, the idea is that skirts used to be a retrofit that fleets will get because of legislation at some point. Uh, after that, fleets will start requesting that directly from the dealership. So the dealership will buy third-party skirts to put them on. And then the OEMs will start just building in house and selling the trailers with it. That's the path that we plan to follow. We start by uh, creating that demand from the fleets, uh, be able to give them the parts that they need, create a service network so they can make sure that everything continues to operate appropriately through the life of the, of the device. Um, and at the same time, start building relationships with OEMs. So at some point, our device will come standard on the trailers. Okay. And uh, last question, the last uh, the 30 seconds or so here, um, wh what are you looking for in, in, in terms of, of talent or partnerships or, or investment, et, et cetera? Yeah. You know, right now we are um, continuing to hire new people. We're actively looking for an aerodynamics engineer to come and join me um, to continue developing this technology. Um, in addition to that, we are looking for partnerships um, like I said, we like to work closely with our customers. So being able to continue building that database of customers, people who are interested in new technology, forward thinking fleets that uh, can see themselves being one of the first companies that are gonna showcase this technology. Um, we're always looking for, for those partnerships as well as for the talent to help us continue bringing this technology to market. Great. Uh, well, David, thanks thanks so much for the, uh, for the deep, deep dive into the exciting technology and, and really exciting uh, business opportunity. So thanks for, for joining us today. Thank you.
Okay, and and I so uh, th this will be important later. So I'll, I'll just point out. So uh, Aero Mutable is in San Diego. Um, now we are we are moving up the coast to a company uh, headquartered in San Francisco. Um, our next uh, speaker is Phil Krinner. He is the CEO and founder of Arch. Um, Arch offers a software for HVAC profes professionals to really um, help automate the creation of, of system designs and proposals, um, turning leads into increased conversion rates. Um, and just as a as a fun fact about um, HVAC, and, and I'm, I'm sure we'll hear uh, more statistics, um, but about half of the energy in homes uh, in the U.S. is used for uh, heating and cooling. So, Phil, thanks for, for joining us today. Awesome. Yeah, th thank you so much, Matt. And wow, David, really, really cool what you're building. So now we're going from deep tech to low tech here. Um, but yeah, let's dive right into it. So so most of your homes are still heated um, with oil and gas furnaces, which are obviously uh, terrible for the environment. Uh, in fact, you know, residential homes are responsible for 18% of all uh, carbon emissions in the US. And, uh, you know, however, there's this technology out there called heat pumps, and, and heat pumps are three to five times as efficient as oil and gas furnaces are, are fully electrical, way lower carbon emissions, and yet they're not very widespread. They're in less than uh, about 15% of all of the, the residential homes. The cool thing is, you know, a year ago, when or even two years ago when i was talking to people about heat pumps everyone's like hey i don't know what this technology is um since the ira i feel like everyone's talking about heat pumps maybe it's just me um but it seems like this this technology has been really taking off and, and another fun fact here uh, heat pumps uh were invented before the the civil war in the us so, so they're actually quite quite an old technology and, and the more surprising it is why there are not more of those installed in the us um yeah, my name is is, is Phil Kriner, and I'm co-founder and CEO of Arch. Um, brief about my background: grew up in Germany in a small strawberry farm. Spent most of my life in robotic solar installation, uh, and built the largest solar power plant in the world in 2018 in Abu Dhabi. And then came to the US, uh, did the MBA and the Masters of Environmental Science at Stanford. Uh, love looking back on that time. And that's also when I learned about uh, heat pumps in the class. What was it called? Understanding Energy. And ever since I've been poking around in, in that space and um, connected also with my co-founder, Sasha, who's a software engineer, third time founder. And together we we, we launched uh, Arch and we're building the end-to-end -end platform for HVAC installers that helps them to become more efficient and provides also more transparency to the homeowners. Um, so everything all around sustainable heating and cooling. But now I mentioned how great this technology is and I wanna dive a little bit deeper and take a step back. You know, why, why is it not more widespread? Of the, there must be obvious reasons, right? And so there's more than three. There's also more than six. There's like, we have a list of, and that's ever growing than more than 40 issues. And um, we bucketed in both in two big buckets. One is the homeowner side and one is the installer side. On the homeowner side, um, heat pumps are way more expensive. They have, uh, they're double as expensive as the average gas furnace. Um, that combined with a lot of uncertainty around the savings makes it virtually impossible for the most majority in the US to actually invest in those heat pumps. At the same time, there's an installer shortage. The average, uh, or not the average, but um, some of our customers' uh, queue time, so how long the homeowner actually has to wait for it, is actually 13 weeks. And lastly, I've yet to meet a single homeowner who had a really good experience with um, swapping their, their heating and cooling system. And shifting gears, going on the installer side, there's also a bunch of issues. Um, so let's say someone wants a new heating system, they call the installer, the installer picks up, ask a few basic questions. Based on these questions, uh, an on-site visit team is, is dispatched and visits the home, takes around one to two uh, hours, um, they take some measurements, they go back, um, they spend another hour, hour and a half all in uh, on creating a rough system design, creating a quote and sending it to the customer. So on average, they now spend around four to five hours. They have a sales conversion rate of around 30%, meaning 70% of the time, actually wasted the time and even more important 70% of the time that didn't generate revenue. 
And why is it they have a lot of highly manual processes from inspecting the home to actually making the load calculations um, and, and, and these processes. And lastly, they're also exploited by manufacturers. I called Carrier the largest US-based manufacturer of heat pumps. I told them, look, I'm starting this company. Uh, I want to order 2,000 heat pumps next month. What's my deal? What, what deal can you give me? And off the bat, I got a 40% discount. So that also shows us there's a lot of um, um, yeah, opportunity to actually decrease the cost on the equipment side as well. And so, um, yeah, what is it more in more detail what we are building? The Arch installer platform has three main modules. It's a design and engineering module, the sales engine, and the financing solutions. So let's start with the uh, design and engineering. So in the first step, we are building basically this digital twin of a home. We are sourcing a bunch of different data sources, um, build this digital twin, and based on the digital twin, we are estimating the um, heat load for the entire home, but also for each individual room. Based on the digital twin, we then optim like size the entire HVAC system optimally. So basically, we're reducing the upfront cost by having like the smallest possible system and just as big as necessary. And that brings us to the sales engine. Engine the sales engine has two modules. One, it pre-qualifies the customer, so it, it qualifies, gives them a lead score, tells them like, hey, this is actually a good customer. You should focus on them. It automates the paperwork and it also tailors the messaging from the proposal to the individual um, homeowner's needs. And lastly, because heat pumps are more expensive, in order to actually get more or give more access to more households in the US, we need also more financing solutions and more especially more competitive financing solutions. So we are going to integrate with banks. We're going to um, uh, connect the, the homeowners via the installer with multiple different um, financing solutions. And uh, again, one level deeper. So we're using a lot of open source data. It's all uh, publicly available, um, use advanced analytics. And then the first step, create um, this, this model of the home. It's not really like actually in a 3D model. It's more a heat load floor plan, so to say. So we, we give the installer in the first step a really 360 degree view of the home without having been on site, right? That's all done um, on their computer from the office. And in the next step, we are done. Uh, we are done. Then recommending the best possible system. So we integrate with the ERP system. We'll check their inventory, and we then match the um, available or incoming inventory with uh, the needs of the individual home, and perfectly size the, the system. We then integrate with third-party providers to do a cost-benefit analysis and basically um, predict what uh, the benefits are for for the homeowner. And in the last step, it's all about um, actually closing, closing the deal with the with the homeowner and really getting them, you know, not to buy a gas furnace, but uh, decide for for a heat pump, um, considering all the rebates out there, um, making it a very um, appealing proposal that is tailored to their needs. And uh, hopefully they they close the, the installer can actually close the homeowner um, very quickly rather than spending hours and hours. And uh, yeah, a little bit where we're at. Um, we are currently a team of five. Um, we are growing. We're a venture-backed company. Um, have some some amazing partners. Some of them are the among the largest climate tech investors in the world. And um, yeah, and, and now we're expanding our team with a senior full-stack software engineer. So if you're an engineer and, and you want to fight climate change at scale, um, please reach out and and check out our website at uh, getarch.com as well. Um, we have a lot of tailwind from the, the IRA. So it's a super exciting time to be in this market. We got super lucky. I didn't expect the IRA to be signed. Um, we closed the week before the IRA. So <laughs> got, got very lucky on, on, on that end. And, and with that, I'm happy to open it up to questions, Matt. Great. Thank you, Phil. Um, so uh, I'm going to start actually with something that's that's just, just bugging me. So, so why are... Um, heat pumps more expensive? Is, is there sort of a simple reason? It's old technology, um, it's been... So the, it's mainly the, the technology, and so it's like the, the compressor. The compressor is just way more expensive than any gas furnace. I mean, gas furnace, if you think about it, it's basically just burning like gas. It's basically just the the um, the module that actually creates the flame. So the, the heat pump itself is, is just inherently um, slightly more expensive. That being said, we're seeing actually um, not necessarily that the manufacturing cost drops, but the, the efficiency increases. So there's a new turbo compressor now coming out that even increases the, or supposedly increases the efficiency of a heat pump by another 20%. So uh, while the material doesn't necessarily drop, the output of the heat pump will actually um, 
increase. And so we are going the right direction. Um, I don't want to make the direct comparison to solar because solar, the, the learning curve was extreme and we, we landed to by less than like a tenth of the price, I think over like eight years. Um, that's not going to happen with, with heat pumps, but we are going to see an, an, an even um, like even more efficiency. So to answer your question, yeah, the, the inherent material is, is more expensive. Um, but then at the same time, the Biden administration put a lot of incentives in place for uh, manufacturers to actually invest in the uh, uh, in, in heat pumps and the manufacturing capacity. So we are going to see that they're, the pricing are going to down and the volume of gas furnace was, was just always higher. But now it's, it's, it's changing. I think uh, two weeks ago, uh, Rewiring America announced that more heat pumps are now sold than, than gas furnaces for the first time ever in the U.S. Okay. okay. Um, and then kind of diving into the technology a little bit more. So you, you mentioned it kind of starts with creating this digital twin of, yeah. the, of the home. What, so what data do you need to access in order to do that so that it's, you know, it enables you to do an effective design? And, and what portion of homes... Can you get that data for, or, or what proportion of your customer base can you easily get that, that data for? Yeah, that, that's the key question, right? And that's where a lot of our intelligence comes in and like creativity and how, uh, how are we getting those data insights? You know, some, some of those data sources are like the obvious ones. It's like, you know, like the, the Google Maps of the world, the silos of the world, um, et cetera. And then you can also even get more creative. Um, you can actually look at um, infrared heat loss data um, that's more and more available. You can look at lighter data and not just like think about, you know, now you know how the shape of the home, um, you can actually derive way more from, from the lighter data than, than just the shape of a home. And um, so it's really like a lot about data hacking. Um, so half of our team spends all the time on just like finding the different data sources and actually being very creative of gathering and getting these insights. And over time, these feed into our models that then become smarter and actually identify, ah, okay, with these different data points, this is what the outcome is. This is what the digital twins, that's what the heating um, uh, loads are. Okay. It, and, it, is, it is quite a creative task. Right. And and the so the idea is to, to build digital twins for just a huge number of homes and basically have a big database of that, that, that you can then um, leverage immediately when you're engaging a uh, an HVAC installer, or, or 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 do you or do basically do they come to you telling you which homes or which neighborhoods they're they're operating in? Yeah, so it would actually be the the homeowner. So we are a white label integration into any installer's website. So a homeowner would actually sign up and request a quote. So they type in their address. Um, they give us access to if they have a utility account. They give us access to a utility account. And based on, on this information, we then start sourcing all types of information about the, the homeowner, but also the home itself. Okay. And, okay. Um, and then the install basically triggers the process of actually conducting the, the analysis. So from the computer, they would just be like, okay, um, Matt needs uh, requested, a, requested a proposal. Um, so let's analyze this home. Let's see what data is available. Um, that's when we are automatically sourcing, tell the installer, hey, this is the data that is available. Here's something we are missing. So we might need to fill in the gaps. Um, but as we are um, analyzing more homes, we are actually getting smarter and can actually fill more of the gaps with uh, like, I mean, it's a buzzword, I know, but it's it's actually artificial intelligence that starts okay. filling the gaps um, over time. Okay. So you, so you have to market to homeowners then it, it, to, to get them to sign on first? Is that the... No, so it's actually the... So there's there's so much demand right now. Um, so homeowners are going on the installer's website okay. and the, the homeowner actually never notices that they're interacting with us. Okay. They, they're only interacting with the, um, with the installer. And so the installer is just using our software tool to actually conduct the analysis. Um, so we always use the the the, the peril. Um, we always use like Aurora Solar, not that I think Tomcat company uh, yeah. as a role model. So we are basically the Aurora Solar for for heat pumps. And in fact, yeah, the, we are we are extremely close to the to Sam and and Chris. Great. Yeah. Um, and uh, what about competition in, in in this space? What are your competitors, and sort of how are you differentiated? Yeah, um, so a lot is popping up now. Um, I think it's a lot of momentum in the space. Uh, I think there's even like other uh, Stanford companies that are that are doing something similar. Um, 
yeah, I mean, honestly, it's it's an exciting space. It's it's kind of a white space. The industry has been doing things for the same, uh, like um, for the with the same processes for the last twenty years. Um, you know, there's a company like CoolCalc. They are a really good um, load calculation tool, but they use none of the intelligence. So it's a very manual process. So it's still the installer needs to plug in the information, the R values of the in, in the, of the installations of the home, for example, and then CoolCalc. Uh, allows you to do the load calc, but um, not none of the software tools today are really using any of the intelligence in the market. Uh, we are seeing more to pop up. And honestly, I think it's exciting. We need all hands on deck. So the more heat pumps out there, the better. I think there's not not really a, a loser out there um, as long as, as we all win. And um, and then maybe sort of last question, if, if you can kind of give us a sense of, of where you are in the deployment of the, of the, of the product. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's out in the field now. Um, we just launched it. Um, we we did like we spent a lot of time just testing different models, tested a lot of demos, um, and now just started um, field deployment. Fantastic, uh, Phil. Thanks a lot for uh, for sharing the the story with us. It's really exciting, okay. and, and we uh, look forward to uh, to seeing how uh, how Arch grows. So. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, so our our uh, final for our final speaker, we are actually going to a a new continent. Uh, so uh, Sarah Johnson is the uh, founder and CEO of Revivo, um, and uh, Revivo is a uh, basically a, a marketplace and a and a funding platform um, for quality uh, spare parts and accessories for electronics repairs uh, in Kenya. Um, electronic waste, just to just to kick things off before I turn it over to, to Sarah, is um, the fastest growing global waste stream, um, and uh, it's growing particularly rapidly in uh, in the developing world. So, uh, Sarah, thanks for joining us today. Awesome! Yeah, excited to to be here. Let me just pull up my presentation. All right. Uh, so as was mentioned, I'm, I'm Sarah, I'm the founder of Revivo. We're a platform for repairs focusing on emerging markets. I think it's always good to talk a little bit uh, before I jump in about my own story uh, and how I, how I got interested in this topic. Uh, so I've been based here in East Africa for about six years total now. Uh, and a lot of that time I was working in the off-grid solar industry uh, in, the, in the product side. So I was leading the solar product team for a company called Bbox. Uh, and my team was developing uh, electronics ranging from radios to televisions to smartphones, basically the whole suite of appliances uh, that you need in your house. Uh, and we were selling millions of them per year across, uh, across the African continent. Uh, and I loved that work. I think a lot of those products you know, can, can be life-changing, uh, but I also started to realize that there was a problem here. A lot of these products were getting pumped out or getting sold in increasing volumes. Uh, and there often just isn't the right maintenance and repair ecosystem in place. The electronic sector is actually growing more quickly in Africa than anywhere else. This is a growing problem here. Uh, and because it's growing so quickly, uh, there's also some pretty significant environmental impacts that come from this. So if we look just at greenhouse gas emissions, uh, over 1.5% uh, of global emissions come from producing consumer electronics. So just the production. Uh, and then e-waste, as was mentioned, is also the fastest growing global waste stream in the world. Here in Kenya, only about 10% of e-waste is actually properly handled. Uh, and the result is that has major negative impacts both on the environment uh, and human health. And as the electronic sector grows here, often the, uh, the length of time that products stay alive is decreasing. Affordability is a, is a major issue. And so companies are trying to push the cost down, down, down. The result, unfortunately, is that products uh, are dying more and more quickly. So I became really interested in this and how we could build a stronger, a stronger repair ecosystem that starts to tackle this. You know, if you can double the life of a smartphone, you've effectively cut uh, its emissions per day of use in half, similar with e-waste. So repairs and maintenance have, have are a big, uh, big powerful tool to, to solve this problem. Uh, I went back to, to business school uh, at Stanford. I just graduated this June, uh, and I spent a lot of my time there just exploring this problem. So we interviewed uh, hundreds of repair shops, close to a thousand customers that were looking for repairs in this region, hundreds of stakeholders, uh, not only in Africa, but really across the world that are, look, that are working in the, uh, 
the repair and refurbishment space. And one of the things that we found is that there's actually huge demand for repairs. So here in Kenya, there's about 50 million people, and yet there's 74 million electronics repairs that are at least attempted every year. So there's a big demand uh, to get products repaired. And a lot of this is driven by affordability. If I have a, a smartphone, if I have to buy a new one, that's the equivalent to a month's income for the average Kenyan. Getting it repaired is about 10% of that. So there's big economic drivers to try to get repairs. And yet 94% of people said they face challenges in getting repairs. So big demand for this powerful tool, really painful process, like pretty much universally across the board for, for everyone involved. And the vast majority of these repairs are done by tiny repair shops like Fred's Communications here uh, that are run by one or two uh, repair technicians. They're semi-formal or informal, um, maybe do five to, to 20, 20 repairs per day. And we really believe at Revivo that the way to, to solve this sort of repair challenge and make repairs accessible is by helping all of these small businesses to, to grow and thrive. We're doing this by solving their biggest challenge. The biggest challenge of these small repair shops is accessing spare parts. So if I'm Fred over here and somebody comes to me with a Huawei Y3 phone, it's not charging, I need to buy a new charging port, I somehow have to find that spare part among hundreds of thousands of SKUs, hundreds of thousands of different parts, hundreds of vendors, super variable price, super variable quality. So these, these repair shops really struggle to find the parts they need to actually be able to, to repair devices. Price is a big challenge. You know, some vendors charge up to 50% more than others. Quality is a major issue. Uh, and also they struggle to, to maintain the working capital to actually be able to keep basic parts at their shops. So that when customers, customers come to them, they can, uh, they can solve the, the problem relatively quickly. So Revivo solves these challenges. We're a B2B marketplace for electronics, spare parts, refurbished devices, uh, as well as electronics repair tools uh, and accessories. So basically everything that a repair shop might need to, to buy. We provide aggregated products. So it's easy to go on our site and see products across hundreds of vendors. Well, 10 vendors now, eventually hundreds of vendors. Uh, visible pricing, so they can be sure they're getting the, the best price guaranteed quality because we vet all of our vendors and they all have to sign up to a quality guarantee where if there's an issue, they have to reimburse the, the client, which is not the norm at the moment. And we also offer embedded financing through the sites. So we launched about seven months ago uh, when I graduated uh, and we're already seeing pretty, pretty significant traction. So we've sold, actually now we're almost up to, about to cross the 30,000 uh, product mark uh, through our site. We have 10 suppliers onboarded with a little over 3,500 product listings. Uh, and to sort of show the value we add on the, the supplier side, we've had 100% uh, retention there. We have over 400 active customers purchasing uh, parts through our site, uh, and we're growing about 40% every month. So growing, growing pretty rapidly. Our traction is also reflected in, in the experience of our, our customers, which I think is important to come back to. Uh, so one of the repair shops we work with said, I love Revivo Kenya because of quality spares, affordable prices, and the latest loan feature. I've achieved a lot because my clients are happy and refer others to come to us. I think this is also an, an important moment globally for, for sort of repair and refurbishment industry. There's increasing attention being paid to it, uh, I will say, particularly outside of the U.S., um, there's a number of successful repair and refurbishment companies that have really popped up recently, shown the sector's potential, everything from back market, you break iFix, iFixit, um, we do mostly operate uh, in, in the States. Uh, an increasing number of countries are passing extended producer responsibility and right to repair laws. Uh, Europe is really leading the way with a lot of these, but India has also passed some pretty innovative laws, uh, and Kenya actually is I think imminently going to pass uh, some extended producer responsibility uh, laws and you know the solar sector I used to work in is already getting together and, and thinking a lot harder about the e-waste uh, sector uh, and how, how we sort of extend extend the life of devices. So I think this is a, a really exciting time. Uh, and also, you know, I mentioned affordability is a big, a big driver for, for repairs here in Kenya, but even outside of Kenya, uh, you know, the rate of innovation for a lot of standard electronics is slowing down, and we're starting to see that drive uh, increasing, increasing demand for, for refurbishment and, and repair as the, the allure of the, the next fancy iPhone is, uh, is slightly less than it used to be. 
This sector also represents a, a huge opportunity from a, from a financial standpoint. Uh, so in Kenya alone, the electronics repair and refurbishment market is about a billion dollars. Um, and that's you know for a relatively small country. And then if you if you look uh, across Africa, it's close to to twenty six billion. Uh, and that number is only going to grow uh, as as the electronic sector continues to grow on the continent. Uh, it's growing growing quite rapidly. We have an awesome uh, team, all based here in Nairobi. Uh, so I talked a little bit about my background. I also have um, my uh, both my bachelor's and my MBA from Stanford. Um, Urbanus is our head of operations. He's got lots of uh, multinational sort of large scale logistics and operations experience. Uh, and then Rita and Karen are our two associates, uh, both young, but uh, wickedly smart and, uh, and super hardworking. So uh, amazing team, a lot of fun to work with. Yeah, that's that's us. Um, I will say a couple things uh, about ways I'd love to connect very quickly. Um, so we are uh, fundraising at the moment. Uh, we're raising a, a pre-seeds. Happy to connect with anybody on that. Uh, and we're also still looking for an intern this summer through Tomcat. Um, so if anyone loves the idea of coming uh, to Nairobi, it's a beautiful city. Any weekend, you can go to the beach, go hike a mountain, go on a safari, um, reach out. I'd love to chat with you about uh, about interning with us. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Um, this is really impressive. I particularly see such such rapid growth. Um, actually, I want I want to start this. So, it's a forty percent uh, growth. Um, we, you know, what does that mean for sort of growing your team and growing your your, your business? What are your plans yeah. for the next, for the next year or so? Yeah, so there's there's a couple pieces there. Part of it, um, our biggest bottleneck right now is that we're still our MVP was in Shopify, uh, and we're in the process right now of transitioning out of Shopify. And Shopify just has like major technical constraints on how quickly we can grow. It means a lot of our a lot of our business is still in in spreadsheets. Um, so that's kind of priority priority number one. And the the Tomcat grant actually has helped us develop our our new website that's going to allow for a little bit more automation in a couple a couple key places. Uh, and then we are as soon as we uh, as soon as we close this round, we've got a number of hires that we're looking to make uh, in both the product and the operation space. Uh, in particular, we're going to be looking for an awesome uh, awesome product manager to come come join our team. Great. Um, and it, just so I can kind of understand the 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 full sub supply chain here. So to, to the the suppliers who um, list their products on your site, um, where are they sourcing all of those? those parts from? Yeah, so there's there's sort of three three groups of suppliers. So the biggest at the moment are importers uh, who are importing third-party aftermarket parts, uh, mostly from China. Most of those are produced there. Also, just a lot of the devices that are sold here are by Chinese brands, are produced in China. So that's where, where a lot of parts come from. Um, so that's the first bucket of suppliers. The second one, we work with e-waste recyclers to actually refurbish parts from uh, old devices that are that are given to them for recycling, but still have good quality parts. So we, we uh, harvest and then refurbish um, parts from them and resell those. Uh, and then sort of the newest category, which we're in the, the process of developing some partnerships with, is, uh, is the original device manufacturers. So we're looking at uh, a couple sectors to actually partner with them. Uh, and not only is that like a great, uh, I think a great source of parts, but also we're working on building out in our platform more resources for the repair shops we work with. So things like repair guides, information on how to like do key parts repairs, how to build a strong repair business. Um, so we're launching a, a sort of blog around that next week. But by partnering with the device manufacturers, we can also get repair guides uh, from them onto the site as well and, and start building up that that section of the site. And, and have you found it easy to get traction with the with the manufacturers um, in the sense that that at some level, I guess this is maybe affecting the the business of new sales for them, yeah. but but making their customers happier. So so how does that yeah. um, how does that played out? Yeah, so we're we're starting with um, I don't know. I guess you call it like the easier sectors. So a lot of the companies we're talking to right now are in the solar space. So they're companies like the one I used to work with that have a, a sort of inbuilt commitment to sustainability. Okay. Are thinking a lot about e waste right now, and so our proof of concept is is going to be sort of in that in that space. Probably their appliances, so like radios and TVs and things like that produced produced by them. Um, 
I do think the the you know the phone companies and and things like that are going to be more challenging. The market here is interesting in that uh, there's a lot because there's a lot more demand for pairs. It's actually a big factor uh, in people's purchasing decisions. So there's research that shows I'm much more likely to purchase an electronic if I know that I'm going to be able to get it repaired. So the incentives for for some of the original manufacturers are a little different, and they do recognize that. They know that repairability is, is important. Um, they focus, you know, when they launch new products, much more on warranty, much more on things like that than they would in the U.S. So I, I think the incentives might be aligned, um, but it, it will, I think, be a, a bigger sell, which is why we're, we're sort of starting with, uh, with some of the, the easier sectors. Sure. Um, and this is probably too too early to really project ahead too much, but I, I mean, are you thinking ultimately of sort of integrating um, uh, and, you know, basically being the the supplier and the platform that connects parts to to repair shops and maybe even integrating on the on the recycling end as well? I mean, is, is that sort of a vision ultimately yeah. for, for Revivo? Yeah, definitely. We want to sort of be an end-to-end -end platform for these devices kind of throughout their life cycle, right? So I think there will be a big opportunity to collect products back yeah. through our same channels, refurbish them um, to potentially start sourcing certain parts ourselves. Uh, and then some of the other spaces we're looking at, uh, you know, another big pain point in the ecosystem is finding a good repair shop. We're going to know a lot about our repair shops. So we might be able to be a connector between customers and their repair shops. And then also use those shops as a way to offer things like device insurance that makes uh, makes repairs more affordable uh, and protect potentially uh, like warranty management itself. Once we partner with some of the device manufacturers, we could actually do in warranty in warranty repairs uh, since those aren't accessible to the vast majority of people unless you're unless you're in you know Nairobi or, or a big city. And um, just a little bit about the, uh, connecting with the repair shop. So, I, I mean, I know you had this history in in Africa, but but when you were, you know, sort of doing the customer discovery, how, how did you how did you find and connect with with all of these, you know, one and two person repair shops? Uh, what was that process? Yeah. So it was a mix of uh, some Facebook, honestly, like these, these are guys that are just like super active on Facebook. They have lots of technician communities. Uh, and so we found some people that way. We got up an early, uh, an early MVP and started getting some early customers who we could dive into uh, sort of their story with. And then I also spent, you know, a few months back out here in Kenya and we would just, you know, for the first month every day. Me and, and Rita, one of our teammates, would get into a car. We'd kind of like drive an hour or two outside Nairobi and just stop and talk to, to repair shops all along the road uh, and then sort of come back. So it's a lot of just like on the ground, go out right. and, and sort of talk to people. They're actually everywhere. That's a good thing. Like every single town here has at least one repair shop. So all you kind of need to do is just like drive and you're <laughs> inevitably going to run into some of them. Um, well, thank you. I, sh I should point out to everyone that uh, I, I guess it's about four o'clock in the in the morning now for uh, for Sarah. So uh, we we really appreciate uh, you taking the time to to be with us, and I want to thank uh, David and Phil I, I, again as well for uh, for sharing this uh, event with us. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, you know one of the goals here is to make connections. So so please join the the LinkedIn Tomcat Network group. Um, and if you want to follow up uh, specifically with uh, with David or Phil or Sarah, um, please connect with them. And if we can help you in any way, um, just just let us know. So uh, thanks so much. And we look forward to seeing everyone again uh, at the next uh, innovation showcase.